Hi folks, my name is Darren Gertis and I'm going to go over today's events and try to help you understand what's going on in Ukraine. Before I do, I want to ask you to do me a favor. I know that about 100, 200, sometimes more will watch this video. I'm asking you that if you are a regular watcher, a regular um, viewer of my videos, that you'll do something for me and, and tell me that you have if you have. So I think that yesterday's video was one of the most important videos that I put up here in order to understand what's going on, how Putin thinks, just to understand the framework of things. Can I ask you, Would if you are a regular viewer, would you please share that one video, this What Will Putin Do Next video for me? Just somewhere on social media, tell me that you have. I posted it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is. I think this will help people understand what we're really up against because he said some really fascinating things in his speech yesterday. Okay, thank you for doing that. If you're willing to do that, I appreciate it. Okay, okay, today I want to talk about the messaging war and I want to contrast what Zelensky has done with what you see Putin doing and you'll see it all play out in the UN and you'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment. So I'm going to walk through these articles as I always do. And I'm going to start here. Claims Russian troops need to de-Satanize Ukraine is criticized as holy war comparison is made. Lyle claims that Russian troops need to carry out a de-Satanization of Ukraine because of a spread of the cult have been criticized as false. So Moscow has been re repeating these claims uh, of a holy war. Now, this is on a couple levels. One, with the Muslims that are looking at this in Chechnya and calling it a holy war to de-Satanize. But this de-Satanize is the new denial. Nazify. That's what's really going on. And again, you have to you have to take your enemy and dehumanize him so that you can attack him with impunity and and feel good about it. Um, okay, Zelensky. Our, the result of our struggle has be definitely been the liberation of our Ukraine. Zelensky says on the liberation of Ukraine from Nazi Invader Day. So October twenty eighth. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about Zelensky is, and he is just incredibly brilliant at tying whatever event or or whatever it is that like what we have in common what we ukrainians i'm not ukrainian but what from him you what ukrainians have in common with the united states or britain or canada or france or whatever and he'll tie these things together he's doing almost the opposite of what we've done in the united states over the last few years of we we just been at each other in so many different ways over so many political issues he's been looking for common ground and trying to tie things together and he does this beautifully. Watch this. October 28th is already on the calendar. Every year on this day, we celebrate the liberation of Ukraine from the Nazi occupiers. We pay tribute to the Ukrainians who fought and defeated Nazism during World War II. Today, we do it holding not flowers in our hands, but weapons. Today, preserving the memory of the exploits of our ancestors means protecting their achievements. Isn't that brilliant? So he's tying that defense to the modern defense. And he says this, Evil always begins the same way. The invaders call themselves liberators. Right. That's what Hitler did when he defended these Germans who were being oppressed by the Poles or by the Czechoslovakians or whichever. Okay. And then they came in. And that was the pretext to come in. Same thing that, that Putin did. The invasion of one's army is always called self-defense. And he said, we will not be broken by shelling. Now, Generally, that's not the case. I talked about this two or three days ago. Like the the uh, Brits during the Blitz, they were not broken by the shelling, and this generally does not happen. The enemy's rockets in our skies are less scarier than hearing the enemy's anthem on our land. Just what what a way of words. We are not afraid of the dark. The darkest of times for us are not without light, but without freedom. Like. Wow, what a powerful statement. Now, I'm going to show you something about this, this last line. The darkest times are not without light, but without freedom. Let's look at The Guardian. Here he is in The Guardian. You'll actually see Zelensky talk. We are not afraid of darkness. The darkest times for us are not the times without light, but those without will. Now, notice he said without will there. Now, will was the same as freedom. And so that was a translation issue. Now, a couple days ago, I was on a podcast where they wanted to ask me about, well, didn't uh, Zelensky say that he wanted to preemptively nuclear strike the Russians? No, he didn't say that because it was a translation issue. He said preemptive something. Preemptive. It could be strike. It could be kick. It could be attack, but it wasn't a preemptive nuclear strike in that sense. So the Guardian translated that as without will. Now the president of Ukraine's website translated it as 
uh, the darkest times are not without light, but without freedom. And that's what I read over here in the other one, without freedom. So you've got to be careful with the translation issues. Now, there was something else about this. See how he's in this dark background? He's brilliant when he's doing, you know, media kind of things. He's in this dark background, and you're going to see a little bit later, he's standing next to a drone. But he's talking about, we're not afraid of the dark, and he's in this dark background. Notice what he's, he's always wearing this olive drab wherever he goes, because he's looking like the part of the wartime leader that he is. And I just give him high marks for this. Okay, we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about what happened to the UN. And then we're going to talk about, you know, what, what Putin is talking about with the mobilization. And then we'll come back to Zelensky. Now, Russia has a lot of gall. Uh, Russia will do commit war crime after war crime and do horrible, horrendous things to Ukrainians. And then they'll go and complain about the littlest grievance that they have at the Security Council and they'll tie them up. So here is Radio for Europe. Russia's claims of U.S. biological weapons activity in Ukraine rejected at U.N. Security Council meeting. And so here they're saying, we are aware that the Russian Federation has filed an official complaint regarding allegations of biological weapons, says the U.N. official in charge of this. The Russian Foreign Ministry said earlier on October 27th that during the course of the special military operation in Ukraine, evidence and material that shed light on the true nature of U.S. military biological activities on Ukrainian territory were obtained. <laughs> the ministry said that it was left with no choice but to file a complaint with the chairman of the UN Security Council to launch an internal uh, internal investigation into the military biological activities of the United States in Ukraine, according to the ministry statement. Yeah, they're left with no choice. One, they made it up. Two, left with no choice, like they were agonizing. <gasps> we have this, you know, this document or this whatever. They might give the U.S. a black eye. Should we use it? Of course, that's not what's going on because it wasn't there and they weren't left with a, with no choice. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, here is the video and I'm going to show you a clip of uh, both the Russian and then the American response and then the Ukrainian response. So this is right out of The Guardian and here we go. So here is, do you really think that we are naive? Do you really think that the Pentagon is going to inform the high representative of the office of disarmament affairs within the UN about their secret biological programs in Ukraine? Colleagues, I'm going to Okay, so, <laughs> no, they're just making crap up. Of course, if you were running a secret something, you would hide it. And, but this is a conspiracy theory. This is one of the major conspiracy theories that come from the Russians. I was on a podcast not too long ago. I, well, I guess it was a while back. It was back in March. And I was talking about Zelensky and, and that kind of thing. I wrote this ebook about Zelensky. And I'm talking about him and, and explaining things. And all they wanted to know were like, well, what about the bio labs? Well, I can't speak to bio labs. I can only speak to something where there's legitimate hard data. And when you're talking about bio labs, you're in this like secretive kind of realm where you know, what's what's a conspiracy and what's not is not evident. I only go to legitimate, authenticated sources. I don't show you anything other than legitimate sources. So here we have Interfax Ukraine. We have Sky News. We have The Guardian. We have Radio Free Europe. We'll have the Russian Federation website of the, of the president's office because that's a legitimate original source. Now, not because of what they say is true, but because we're validating that it actually did come from Putin. Um, and then we'll have some fun with uh, Russian state media. But we know that we're looking at Russian state media for what it is. So always go to the right sources. Now, here is the American uh, ambassador's response. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to keep my remarks short because frankly, this meeting is a waste of everyone's time. Yep. Russia has called us here once again for the sole purpose of spreading disinformation. That's what it is. We all know these claims are pure fabrications brought forth without a shred of evidence. And I would even venture to say the Russian delegation knows these charges are fabricated, but they dutifully carry out marching orders from President Putin. All Russia has are bizarre conspiracies, conspiracies that are no more credible today than when they first brought it to this council six months ago. So while I believe this meeting is a colossal waste of time, and we should decide just how much of our time we allow Russia to waste. I'm glad this council 
has the chance to see Russia's disinformation campaign. And that's what they're doing. They're just wasting everybody's time by bringing this baseless claim, tying up the time of the United Nations Security Council, when you actually have legitimate war crimes. Remember Oklavina or uh, the, the POW camp that was attacked by Heimers, they say, and they demanded a UN investigation, but they haven't let the UN in or the Red Cross in to examine the thing that they blew up that they said uh, missiles would have come and bombed it. Missiles didn't come and bomb it because they're, they won't allow legitimate investigation to happen while they'll tie this up. Okay, okay. now why are they doing it? She says it right here. D disinformation campaign for what it is. An attempt to distract from the atrocities Russian forces are carrying out in Ukraine and a desperate tactic to justify an unjustifiable war. That's exactly Ukraine. that's exactly what it is. Well, let's also hear what the United Nations ambassador from Ukraine had to say about the same matter. An unjustifiable war. Ukraine has never ever developed, produced, or stored alone or together with someone else, biological or chemical weapons. Our country does not possess a corresponding infrastructure for biological weapons development and production. Formally, this provocative issue has been already raised by Russia many times. The Russian Fed. Okay, so uh, it's a conspiracy theory, but yeah, but you don't know. But that's because it's it's hiding. It's in the back. Well, unless you can verifiably prove something, don't make such assertions. Okay, so while they're tying, while the Russians are tying up the United Nations Security Council, what's happening back in Moscow? And they're running a victory lap. So here is Russia's war on Ukraine. The latest news: Moscow ends its call up. Remember, it was September twenty first when they had this call up, and we're going to partially mobilize, right? Okay, Russia said it had finished calling up its reservists to fight in Ukraine, ending a divisive mobilization drive that had seen tens of thousands of Russian men flee. How many do you ask? Hold on, I will answer that in just a moment. Now, here is the actual... Um, this was all uh, political theatrics, right? So there's a meeting with Defense Minister Sergei Shogu, and it's all scripted, and that's the way that this kind of thing goes down. Just kind of like how their military drills are scripted. So it's not an actual conversation, but here's the conversation. They show the two men. They have their conversation where he reports, and, and he says, oh, good, good, good. Okay, so the target that you set, this is um, Shogu talking now. Okay, the target that you set, 300,000 people, has been achieved. No additional objectives are planned. The military enlistment offices will continue to staff the troops for the special operation only by accepting volunteers. That's his report. So what does this mean? At present, 218,000 people are in combat training as part of crews or in training. And after completing the training, 82,000 reservists were sent to the area special military operation, including 41,000 who joined units there. So they're replenishing those forces that have been killed or wounded in Ukraine. Okay. Last thing, and this is the same thing, Russia says 82,000 conscripts from emergency draft are already in Ukraine. Well, somewhere about 100,000 as a just a ballpark figure have been taken off the battlefield, and so they have to replenish. So they're back to some kind of strength. I don't know how full the strength is. But there was something really fascinating in this particular article. There's these three lines, or these three paragraphs. Thousands of conscripts have been deployed in places such as Bakhmut, where Haidai said that they were being killed or wounded quickly after being thrown into battle against dug-in Ukrainians. So they keep attacking in Bakhmut again and again and again. It doesn't make any military sense to me. I look at the map and I think it's not that strategic anymore, but they keep attacking there. Uh, Suryai Heide, who was the governor of uh, Luhansk, and he was a big prominent feature for a few months, uh, he said the average shelf life of a mobilized personnel is about two weeks. So these guys get poorly trained and throw into battle. It's, it's just a matter of attrition. We can just keep throwing them at them. Um, Ukraine's general staff said on Friday that up to 1,000 Russian conscripts had been sent across the Dnipro River to fortify Herzon. Now, this is the opposite of what we thought. We thought they were trying to get out of there from across the northern border. They were trying to get out to a fortified uh, position, but apparently more are going in, so they're going to have it out there. And then finally, a week ago, it appeared Russia feared losing the city and had relocated commanding officers across to the east bank of the river. And that's why we thought that they were trying to get their men out too, but apparently Apparently not. As long as the officers are safe, let's keep throwing more men at it. Now, now one more article about this before we're done, because this had to, it was the same article covering the same stuff, but it had this really interesting passage. 
An estimated 700,000 Russians, most of them young men, fled to countries like Georgia, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and Turkey, often in desperate journeys to flee the draft. Okay, 700,000 left. And that's probably more than that at this point, but let's just say... So about 150,000 and change went in. So this means four to five times the amount that went into Ukraine to begin with, more than four, probably closer to five times that amount have fled Russia trying not to fight in Ukraine. That is significant. What's it like on the ground in Ukraine? Let's get the perspective of an American fighter who called the war pure evil. And his take on this was absolutely heart-wrenching. An American who volunteered to fight, this is CBS News, to fight against Russia in Ukraine described the carnage as pure evil. Anybody in the West that asked Ukraine to just do peace talks. And I had a conversation about this just today. Like, why can't they just declare peace? Well, they need to see what's been done to these people. Repeatedly witnessed Russian forces using white phosphorus munitions. It's something like napalm. It burns right through the person to the point where Ukrainian fighters are burning alive. Some even committed suicide to end their suffering. A lot of guys had suicide pistols. You'd hear them scream and then they would say goodbye and blow their own heads off. White phosphorus is a wax-like chemical substance that ignites instantly when it comes into contact with oxygen. This American said he has been traumatized by his experience. He's worried that other of his fellow fighters may commit suicide because of what they went through together. But he believes that Ukraine's fight against Russia's invasion is a righteous war. And he said this, he ended it with this, if China invaded the United States, hypothetically leveled Los Angeles, leveled Seattle, Portland, massacred thousands, do you think the U.S. would just sue for peace? So if you're wondering why, why don't they just have peace? Why don't they just get along? You can't. I mean, at this point, the Russians have inflicted by by invading, they have caused generational hatred between those that they say are their brothers. Right, sure. That's not how you treat your brother. Okay, let's look at fun with Russian state media. I'm only going to do two articles today. China praises Putin's remarks that he made yet during yesterday's speech. And of course, they're going to praise his remarks because he was talking about Taiwan and how, well, you'll see. China gave a high assessment to what Russian President Vladimir Putin said about China during his speech. The Chinese foreign ministry spokesman said that we highly appreciate President Putin's positive statements about China. What were those positive statements? The president stressed that Taiwan, without any doubt, is an integral part of China, and all visits of foreign delegations to the island are perceived as a provocation. Okay, well, if you want to score points with China, that's what you do. And finally, this. Zelensky is ridiculed for his photo with downed Russian drone. This is in Pravda. Remember this video we just talked about where he's in this dark background and we don't fear the night, we fear the loss of our freedom. Okay, so in this, he's standing next to a downed drone. But they were talking about how Volodymyr Zelensky was photographed standing next to the wreckage of a Russian kamikaze drone. However, many ridiculed him for the picture. People paid attention to a strange optical illusion because the drone is so long and he's so short and they were going on about that. I don't think Zelensky needs to worry about that at all. His message was loud and clear to his people who were going to continue to stand and fight with him. And this only reinforces his message that he stands and will continue to fight for his people. Okay, that's all that I have today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.